My name is Sister Paula. I'm also on the board, state board, and I have the privilege to introduce our speaker, Mr. Rob Crane, and um, from from the screen you can see that his uh, his topic is conservation in the Northwest Ohio, protecting what's left, restoring what's been lost. I think a very sounds like a very interesting topic on on. Anxious to hear you speak. And uh, Mr. Mr. Crane um, serves right now as the executive director of the Black Swamp, Cons Black Swamp Conservatory. Uh, he's served since 2013. Uh, he joined the Conservancy in 2007, serving first as the conser conservation director before becoming the executive director in 2013. He earned his degree in environmental policy and analysis from Bowling Green State University and an executive certificate in nonprofit management from Georgetown University. He serves on the Land Trust Alliance National Conservation Def Defense Advisory Council and as a member of the steering committee of the Coalition of Ohio Land Trusts. He's also a member of Toledo's Rotary Environmental Committee, um, past chair, chairperson of Ohio Department of Natural Resources, Maumee Scenic River Advisory Council, and has been an honored, has been honored as a 20 under 40 Toledo recipient. Um, looking at his interests, I would say he's a very wholesome man. <laughs> In his spare time, he likes to kayak, and according to this, he's completed a food battle of the Maumee River. Yeah. He also runs an active concert series, um, which hosts uh, Moots Music. Um, sounds very interesting to me, being a musician. And um, let's see, he also loves, enjoys camping, uh, and Let's see, and he lives here in, in, he lives in Toledo um, with his family. I'm excited to introduce, have him begin his presentation. I'm sure it's going to be very interesting. Not often I get to move a microphone. Huh? <laughs> Thank you, sister. Oh, <laughs> John, I think we lost it. Okay, thank you. All right, so I am with the Black Swamp Conservancy. We are a local nonprofit organization, and our mission is to protect and enhance both family farms and natural habitats here in Northwest Ohio for the benefit of the current and future generations. And uh, tonight's um, program and a lot of the work we do these days is really going to focus on those natural habitats. All right. So um, our organization's been around since 1993. Uh, we are a local nonprofit. We have about 185 properties protected um, across a 16 county area here in Northwest Ohio, 23,000 acres of land. Uh, we've helped establish 36 public nature preserves, that keeps ticking, so I had to look. 
And a lot of what I, I'd like to talk about tonight is the uh, landscape scale ecological restoration projects that we've really been focusing on, um, especially in the last couple of years. <coughs> um, a lot of the work that we've done traditionally has been conservation easements and kind of the preserving the best of what's left of Northwest Ohio. There is a lot of amazing natural resource here. I think it's underappreciated just what a dynamic biological community we have here. Um, and I'd just like to highlight a couple of those really special places that we preserve. One of which is the Toussaint Shooting Club. Uh, this is out on Lake Erie right by Davis Vesey. It is our largest conserved property, 1,100 acres of coastal marshland. Um, just an amazing place. This property has two bald eagles nests and the uh, an osprey nest on it. And if you know those species, they don't nest anywhere near each other. So to have them on one site, um, along with 41 rare and endangered species is, is really a special thing. This is a private club. It was established in the, I, mean, I think it was 1885 um, and has stayed you know, this this natural area with this natural undeveloped Lake Erie shoreline uh, for all those years because of the club's control. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple years ago, they partnered with us. They entrusted us to be their forever partner to ensure that this, this special place is forever maintained in its natural condition. And we're, we're really proud to be a part of that. Um, this is the city of Fremont, Ohio. Uh, where we were able to accomplish a really special couple of projects along the Sandusky River. Um, Sandusky has a phenomenal county has a phenomenal park district, um, some really special places, but they didn't have anything that was right in the vicinity of Fremont, which is the population center in uh, in the county. And if anyone spent any time in Fremont. You can see from that top photo there, there's a big flood wall that goes right through the middle of town. And just five, six years ago, if you wanted to go fishing for the walleye run, which is, it's a great walleye run up the Sandusky River there. You actually took a ladder or a pallet and you climbed up and you fished over the, um, over the break wall. So what we were able to do, we were able to acquire two really key properties. Uh, one, on the south side of town, the one on the north side of town, the one on the south was a former nine-hole golf course. Mm -hmm. um, on the the north side there, it's a, a place that we call Red Horse Bend. Red Horse is a fish species that lives in the Sandusky River in the stretch. And um, we restored both of those properties and, and gave them to the Sandusky County Park District. So in doing so, we opened up 200 acres of public access, two miles of natural shoreline for people to enjoy the Sandusky River in a much more natural setting than getting up on a, a ladder and trying to <laughs> show the great fall. This is our Nell's Nature Preserve. So we are now on Catawba Island. If you know Catawba Island, it's a really special place because of the lake and the outdoor recreation and the, the uh, orchards and the vineyards and, and all of the beautiful open space that's out there. <clears throat> But if you've been watching it for the last 10, 15, 20 years, it's rapidly developing. And if we don't save land today, it will be gone tomorrow. Um, I've just seen so many developments pop up. So we were able to pick up this 40 acres um, on Catawba Island. It's on Muggy Road uh, about six, seven years ago. And um, it was a former campground. Um, Dr. Nels was the owner. He passed away. His family um, approached the conservancy, and, and you know we were able to work out a, an opportunity to purchase it and save it from development. You can see in that lower right-hand corner the uh, the beautiful homes that are right on the other side of the ADA to do a kayak launch that we uh, that we installed. And you know if it weren't for this opportunity, this is what that property would have become instead of this this beautiful state, uh, stretch of West Harbor where we, uh, we do some public yoga programming and uh, we, we were able to restore that beautiful prayer you see on the top there. Bell Woods is one of my favorite places. Um, this is in Pembermill, Ohio, directly behind my office. So <laughs> I was lucky enough to sneak out to Bell Woods today uh, and, and walk the trail with some of my staff. 
This is, I, I, I like to say there's three true remnants of the historic Great Black Swamp. We'll talk a little bit about what that, that was and is and could be. Um, and Bell Woods is one of the three. Um, the other two, Gall Woods is the one most people are familiar with. That's a Ohio DNR property. And then Forest Woods, um, which is a property we own in Paulding County. Um, but if you, closest to home, if you want to experience what the historic Great Black Swamp was, Bell Woods is the place. It's, it's just a phenomenal, phenomenal um, wooden wetland. Uh, we have 110 acres out there. 80 of it is that, that remnant swamp forest. We have a restored prairie. Um, and it's really our conservation center. So we've, we've replaced all of the landscaping around our old farmhouse, which serves as our office uh, with native species. And if you, you want to learn how to integrate native species into your gardening, you're welcome to come on out. We'll give you a tour of that. Uh, we've installed solar panels and geothermal HVAC system, um, trying to become more sustainable. And just in the last couple of weeks, uh, we were able to put up a 40 by 60 pavilion with 88 picnic tables. And I'll talk a little bit more later about what we're going to be using that for. Um, I'll also plug the, the stuff we're going to do on the property, but that, that heron is taken on the property. Um, in the middle of our woods is a great blue heron rookery mm -hmm. with about 15 nests. Oh, and if he's snuck out there this afternoon, you know, before the leaves are out, you can see him coming and going and there's chicks in the nest. It's, it's really something else. And then the last kind of remnant I wanted to talk about, this is our newest property. We actually have not finalized the purchase yet, but it's gonna be finalized in the next two weeks, uh, is one that we're calling Weber Woods. This is exciting because it's our first Toledo Metro focused property. And believe it or not, I was really surprised to stumble upon this. In Point Place, there is this 15 acres of high quality category three, the highest quality, remnant wetlands, uh, wooded wetlands. You can see the picture on the bottom there. Um, you know, in a super developed area. And there's also an old beach ridge that we're going to be restoring and has some invasive problems. And there's some historic dumping, but it's it's really an amazing site with a lot of potential. And more than anything, this is some of the most critical bird migratory bird habitat I've run into. Uh, we had Jeremy Dominguez out there a couple weeks ago. He's the ornithologist with the Toledo Zoo. And he couldn't have been more ecstatic no. uh, about this place. So I'll, I'll plug the walk we're going to do with him later as well. Mm. Um, so that's just a few of the many um, really amazing properties we've, we've protected here in Northwest Ohio. And the Great Black Swamp, uh, Black Swamp Conservancy takes our name from that. I hope most folks know that was a 1,500 square mile swamp that stretched from Lake Erie all the way out to Fort Wayne, Indiana, along the yeah. Maumee River. And um, this is a map, a historic map we put together about 10 years ago to try and depict, you know, exactly how that that looked. Um, our service area kind of mirrors the swamp; it's a little larger. We go from Sandusky Bay and the Lake Erie Islands all the way out to the um, the Indiana line. And then from the Michigan line, we're as far south as Kenton. So I have a very small team. There's six of us now. There will be seven next week when we have a new staff member starting. And we are covering the 16-county service area. It's um, I'm, I'm really fortunate to have such good people to work with that, that we're able to do that. Uh, this here is a, a picture of our Forest Woods Nature Preserve, one of those true remnants of the historic Great Black Swamp. And really, this is what our natural history in Northwest Ohio is, is these dark, mucky, wooded wetlands that, that really provide for, for an enormous amount of biodiversity. But as most people probably know, around the turn of the last century, the Great Black Swamp was cleared and drained. We cut down just about every tree in Northwest Ohio. Um, they say every tree in Wood County was cut down at one time. Um, and we drained 95% of our weapons. This was hard work, very, very hard work. It resulted in some of the best farmland found anywhere in the country, but there have been some unintended consequences that we're feeling today, um, both water quality, biodiversity, and otherwise. And what I try to impress upon people who may not know this, we didn't clear the Black Swamp right around the turn of the century. We continue to clear the Great Black Swamp every single day. 
we have a highly engineered landscape mm -hmm. with plumbing. And as you drive around the country, uh, the country, county roads, the country roads, and you see these vast farmlands of, of corn and soybeans, they all have subsurface drainage tile in them. And it, it works very well to keep our land dry and keep it agriculturally productive. Um, but the, the goal of it is to take water off the land as quickly as possible and move it out to Lake Erie. You can see tile drainage is kind of a unique thing to this part of the world. Uh, those dark blues are the tile drainage in the U.S. So when I go to conferences and I, I talk to my colleagues out west about, you know, the tile drainage, they, they look at me like I have three eggs. You know? <laughs> We're doing everything we can to irrigate our land. What are you talking about? <laughs> um, so it's a really unique um, landscape we have here, and it's creating really unique problems. Um, there are things that, you know, are occurring all over the country, but, but really we're, we're at the center of the uh, the nutrient algal blooms, the your, your eutrophication issues because of our landscape and the way we manipulate it. Um, also, we should note, you know, 72% of our our landscape here in Northwest Ohio is row crop out agriculture. Um, the red is your metropolitan areas, your cities. That does not leave much natural habitat. So an aerial view um, taken of a ditch out in Sandusky County. <laughs> Most of our ditches are straight line. This one actually has a couple curves in it um, that almost can feel natural, but, but you do get a sense from this um, just how much of our, our landscape is tilled just how much of it is in production. As you drive along the roadway, it always seems like there's a, a forest in the distance because all the little woodlots blend together at 65 miles an hour. But, but really, our, our habitat's very, very fragmented and, and few and far between on our landscape. This is a typical picture of what our farmland looks like in Northwest Ohio right about now. Um, as we start planting um, just flooded cornfields, and then you know it's it's drained through those subsurface tiles. It comes out an outlet tile into a drainage ditch and gets pushed into Lake Erie very quickly. The problem with that is as that water moves so quickly through the system, it brings with it sediment and nutrients. And those nutrients don't have an opportunity to be taken up by natural vegetation within the system. They end up in Lake Erie and they end up feeding harmful algal blooms and we end up with the uh, with the toxic um, algal blooms that we've been dealing with here in Northwest Ohio and Western Basin. Um, more than anything, you know, this is a picture, I forget which year, of downtown Toledo. But, you know, there's a lot of arguments about where's, where's the nutrient coming from, where are the algal blooms coming from. This is still in the Maumee River, and it's an algal bloom, and we see it every summer. Um, so yes, there's some problems with Detroit's wastewater, and they're putting nutrients into the water that shouldn't be there. And the reality is the Maumee River is carrying such an algal load that we're having blooms in downtown Toledo, we're having them in Napoleon, we're having them as far up as Defiance. Um, so if we're, going to, if we're going to address this problem, we have to address it on our landscape before those nutrients make their way into the river. My favorite way to do that is with wetlands. Wetlands are the most efficient and cost-effective way of treating, uh, treating water, of taking nutrients and other pollutants from our water. They also have this added benefit of being the most biologically diverse habitats anywhere on Earth. So we can support wildlife species while also cleaning the water that we drink, we play in, we boat in, we fish in. And, you know, our, our mission is twofold. We, we do agricultural preservation, we work with family farmers, um, but we also are trying to find a better equilibrium with um, natural habitats and trying to figure out where that balance should lie. So I'd like to highlight a couple of the restoration projects we've been doing. We started this work in 2013 uh, with a property we call Water's Edge, which is down on the Sandusky River. Um, we started it in earnest. We completed quite a few really 
awesome. Um, and I think I'll touch on some of them, restoration projects over the years, working with federal funds. And um, it was a long, hard, slow going process. And then the H2 Ohio initiative came online. And, and I cannot praise that program enough. Um, the speed of conservation and restoration in Northwest Ohio, and now throughout the state as the program has been expanded, has put resources into our organization, our partners organization. Uh, we are seeing an investment in wetlands here in Ohio that has never been made anywhere, at least in the US, probably in the world. Um, so it, it's a really, really exciting time to be working in restoration. And uh, we're, we're just tickled to, to be a part of it. This is that Red Horse Bend property I mentioned on the north side of Fremont. And if anyone's traveled the bypass over the river there, uh, Route 6, Route 20, I did it for like 15 years. And I looked out the window and this is what I saw, just this, this farmland that wasn't producing because the river came up every year and flooded out. And I, I said, why are we farming that? And we eventually had the opportunity to purchase it. And we jumped at the chance. And this was our vision, uh, is our vision for the property. It's an artist rendering we had done. There is a bald eagle's nest there along the river. So we're, we're kind of looking out of the bald eagle's nest. And um, what we wanted to do was create kind of a new and innovative system of wetlands that's specifically engineered to do the most for water quality. It's something that's called a treatment train wetland where you have a series of wetland pools, as you can see in this visual, and the water seeps through each one and gets treated through every one of them before it gets returned to the river. Uh, what's cool about this project, um, not only are we taking on flood waters from the Sandusky River and treating those waters, but because we've got <coughs> right through the middle of it, we're taking all the pollutants off the highway and running those through our treatment train wetlands as well. And uh, we love the way this one turned out. This was taken just after construction, that photo on the bottom, the aerial, and you can see the individual pools that are full of water. Um, next time you're driving you know, through Fremont, take a look out the window there, right? This is the bypass over, uh, the, over the water. And um, you know, that's what you're gonna see is these, these wetlands in, right now in a, a couple of weeks, um, the whole property is gonna be flooded. But even in the summer, these patches of wetlands uh, remain jank. So when you say restoring it, does that mean removing the tiles? Yeah, yeah. So we come in, we rip out the tiles, or we crush them if they're old clay, we'll just crush them, but we make them inoperable. And the whole goal is to keep the, land, the water on the land as long as possible. The name of the game that we're playing is water retention. How long can we keep it on the land uh, and let the plants take it up with the natural processes um, moving? So yeah, we disable the, the tiles. We do um, some topographic um, changes. This is heavy equipment, big expensive projects to, make, to get this done. Uh, Rerouting water, taking ditches, putting them back into natural streams. It's, it's fun stuff. Um, and, and of course, we have the added benefit, as we do with a lot of these projects. You know, we're creating water uh, quality benefits, we're enhancing wildlife habitat, but then this is a public park too. So this is a place where people can go out and safely and healthy recreation. This is kind of a similar project we did on the Maumee River. Um, it's a property we call the Rotary Riverside Preserve. And there were a lot of things attracted us to this property. We're just outside of Liberty Center, if you know where that is, um, on this property, <coughs> between Grand Rapids and Napoleon. Um, so the northern end of this property is the old Towpath Canal, which is now the Buckeye Trail. That's a, a public walking trail uh, that actually circles the entire state. And every now and again, we have people that, that through like the Buckeye Trail, which is awesome. Uh, you can also see that dark line at the top in the existing woods. That is a natural oxbow wetland. It's a very high quality wetland. It's full of salamanders and frogs and all kinds of fun stuff. And that's what we often look for when we're doing restoration is can we find a really nice piece of habitat and expand upon? Can we take the species that are living there and give them room to grow out and expand their population? Um, and then the other the other thing to mention about this, this project, you can see kind of in the top uh, 
the northwest side, the top left corner, those blue pools, those are, are deep blue pools. And um, what we did is we specifically designed this restoration project in a manner where we could release, use it to release pirate perch, which are an Ohio endangered species. And we're working closely with the Ohio DNR, who is rearing pirate perch. And I believe starting next year is going to start releasing them in those pools. So we created the optimal habitat. They, they uh, when they're very young, they need to be up in these oxbows protected. And then as the, as they they get older and the property floods out, they'll make their way into the river. So we're hoping that this is a project that's going to uh, help bring that population back and, and hopefully delist the species among many, many other efforts. I, I mentioned the, the heavy equipment. Um, this property and a lot of the work we do is um, we're, we're uh, creating what we call hummock and hollow uh, wetlands, little vernal pools or seasonal wetlands. And what we're trying to do with this heavy equipment, as this, this illustration um, shows, is we're trying to mimic a natural forest. So in a natural forest, a big tree falls, the root ball comes up and you get a big divot in the land. That becomes your vernal pool. Um, the tree starts to decay and you get a little mound of earth. So what we do is we go in, you can see the cross section on the bottom there, and just take little divots out of the earth. Um, it, it's not as <laughs> it's not as happenstance as, as it might sound. It, it's all highly engineered. Uh, but essentially that's what we're doing. It's just putting these little holes all over the landscape that are going to hold the water and, and get us back to a great black swamp ecosystem in 100 years. Immediate benefits long term to really get to our, our ultimate habitat goals. So this, this is that site you can see in the top left there. Um, that is before construction. It was a soybean field. Again, it flooded out over the year. Uh, the top right there, that was during construction. You can see all those little divots we made, uh, hundreds of them across this 100 acres property along the Maumee River. And then you can see we were starting to construct those, uh, those deep pools um, up along, along the entrance to the property at that point. Uh, by November 23, uh, the habitat was really, really coming along. You can see uh, the, those permanent wetlands where the pirate perch are going to go are inundated full year, um, all year round. There's a couple of feet of water in there to support the species. And then um, that picture on the bottom right was taken just on Saturday. Um, and it's standing basically, you know, just as you come down the hill there on this side of those pools. And you can see the entire property is flooded out. Um, we uh, we broke down some some old dams that have been built up along the river to keep the flooding out. So now that that water is all able to come in, and as it starts to recede slower out into the Maumee River, all of those vernal pool wetlands uh, that we created are going to hold back water, create more retention time on the landscape, and uh, feed the vegetation that's there. All right, this is, we, we, we're doing a lot of this work, but this is the last restoration I want to talk about. And again, it ties back into how we look at these projects, not only for their environmental um, components, but also how we can leverage them for human beings and how we can make them better places for us. So this is a, a really small site for Black Swan Conservancy. It's just about 20 acres, and it's on Tintagany Creek uh, in Wood County. Uh, this feeds into the Maumee River just a couple of miles up. But what's uh, what's really cool about this, and you can't see it. Can you see that on the screen? Okay. Anyway, just off to the west, you see the road um, that comes off our access lanes, covered by our legend is the Otsego School District, which was a K through 12 school district. And that's what got us really excited about this project, is we, before we entered into a purchase agreement to, to buy it, we approached the school district and said, hey, what do you think about us creating a living laboratory for your students? And they were so enthusiastic that we had to get enthusiastic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, you know, we, we hit all of the water quality goals, all of the habitat goals that we were trying to do out here. And then we went the extra mile and we engaged the students and we engaged the teachers and we said, how can we make this a place for outdoor learning? 
And um, just a couple things. I, I can't point, but there's a little Boulder amphitheater up on the north end where they can have classes. Um, the cross country team is going to be using the, the loop trail. We did it at, I think it was three quarters of a mile, is what they asked for. Mm -hmm. So it's exactly three quarters of a mile for the cross country kids to run. Um, there's a, a demonstration agriculture area out there in the center. That's for their FFA students to learn about how natural habitats and farmland can coexist. Um, one of the really cool things we talked to their, their seventh grade science teacher who's just amazing. And she said, well, every year, you know, one day I pile all the kids in a bus and I take them down to the Maumee River and we do stream sampling. And, you know, it's really expensive for us to get a bus. What we did is we created these stepping stone pools into Tintagami Creek. And now they don't go to the Maumee River once a year. They go out to Tintagami Creek over and over and over again. So they get to go out before a rainstorm, after a rainstorm, see what the differences are. Um, it's, it's just a, a really, really cool partnership. Uh, you can, these are just kind of a couple of the, the photos. The ones on the top, we, we went into the school with the seventh grade student, science students and we did a design charrette. So we got their feedback, you know, we were at like 30% engineering and design. And so well, what are we missing? They had lots of ideas. Mm -hmm. Most of them were really good. <laughs> uh, and then when we did the tree planting, um, those pictures on the bottom, the seventh graders came out and helped us plant all trees, which is yeah. just a super, super fun couple of days. This leads into um, something I, I have to mention, which is our learning landscapes uh, program that we are in the process of launching right now. 2024 is our launch year for this. Uh, Laura Rodriguez is our events and education coordinator, and she has been working with other conservancies across the country who kind of started this model, and she has just been busting her tail, tailoring this for Northwest Ohio. Um, our office space at Bellwoods, the, the uh, Pat and Glenson Prairie, is right across the street from the Eastwood K-12, through and then we, we now have the Fox Shank Preserve, which is across the street from Montsego. So we're launching it there this year. But this is just the start of what we hope to be a really, really meaningful um, program. We are looking to continue to put preserves adjacent to um, school systems where teachers can utilize them to get their students out. Uh, this summer, we are doing a teacher training workshop where we're going to have teachers out from both schools to learn how to integrate uh, the preserves into their studies. They're going to get continuing education credit for that. We're also not just focusing on science. We're talking to the art teachers. We're talking to the literature teachers. We are talking to the math teachers. How can we bring the outdoors and nature and education slash play? I always want to encourage the play outdoors into your everyday routine at school. And that's where we're really excited. We just got a grant from the Ohio EPA um, on each of these properties, we're going to be uh, creating what Laura calls her lending libraries. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be building a shed on each property. We're just going to give the teachers the combination. And inside that shed's going to be you know, rubber boots for going out in the swamp. It's, there's going to be you know rain gear if it's needed. And there's going to be 50 backpacks, um, mm -hmm. 25 elementary and then 25 upperclassmen. And they're going to be filled with stuff to help with the education of the kids and outdoors. So field guides, binoculars, and you know everything that those teachers can use. They're gonna manage them. We don't have to be there. We're gonna give them to the tools to take their kids outdoors. And there's a lot to be developed here, but I think we've made some really great strides and I'm really excited to see where this goes. So I, I had to mention that today. Also, I gotta plug some upcoming events. Um, Bell Woods, that woods behind my office, one of the nicest wildflower blooms you can ever see. The trillium is a carpet out there, and they are just starting to open up. Um, this Sunday, I'm going to be leading a walk out there, 11 a.m., and then Sunday the 28th, I'm going to do another walk out there. It's been such a weird weather season. We wanted to make sure we hit the, the peak wildflowers, so we thought we'd better do this twice. Um, so. Uh, please check out our website. You can email Laura and let her know you'd like to come. We would love to show you this. 
We'll walk through the woods. We'll take you out to the heron rookery. You can look up. We'll put a scope on the nests, and hopefully, hopefully, you can see some baby chicks, some wildflowers. I was telling Jay before um, before the talk, we actually found a porcelain salamander out there today. Mm -hmm. That's a new species record for us at Bell Woods, mm -hmm. and it's a uh, it's I think it's a state threatened. It might be a uh, species of concern, but it is definitely a rare species. Um, Hopefully they don't move real fast. They like to hunker down and under the same log. So hopefully we can find them again on Sunday if anyone can make it. And then that Weber Woods out on Point Place. Jeremy Dominguez, if you don't know him, he's the ornithologist at the Toledo Zoo. Really engaging, really knowledgeable guy. Um, and he's going to be leading a bird walk out, out at the Weber Woods on uh, May 25th. So hopefully you can, you can join us for that as well. Um, our annual fundraiser is a really good time. It's kind of a casual backyard barbecue. Um, that is coming up on June 15th. Um, we are having it at the campus of Westside Montessori School, which is a really great space we've used in the last couple of years. And uh, we're bringing in, this is actually an animal depiction of the actual band we're gonna have. <laughs> Joshua was very kind to let me turn him into a fox. Uh, but Joshua Davis, who's, who's an amazing musician, if you don't know him, you may have seen him. He was a finalist on the TV show The Voice um, a couple years back. Um, but he's been a long stand in the Michigan scene. And he's, he's just a, a fantastic musician. I got to plug one more kind of weird event thing that we're doing um, this year. I'm so excited about this. Um, so we're, we're starting a series we call Paddle and Groove and trying to engage people and get them better connected to the Maumee River in downtown Toledo. So we, uh, we've got a pontoon boat. We are going to be putting live bands on the pontoon boat on Wednesday evenings. Um, and we're working with the, uh, the Maumee Bait and Tackle. They're going to bring canoes and kayaks, or canoe, excuse me, kayaks out and rent them. So if you have your own boat, you can bring your own boat. If you need to rent a boat, we are just gonna slow roll down the river um, and have a two hour concert. And it's gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, July 24th, we're kicking it off with Shamar Allen. He's a, a great trumpet player from New Orleans, Louisiana. He's bringing his, his band, The Underdogs. Uh, Charlie Millard is coming August 14th. Charlie is just a dynamo um, piano player from up in northern Michigan. And then the Bay Ben Gage Band is coming over from Cleveland on September 11th to close it out. We're really hoping these make a big splash so we can go again next year and maybe do even more in one month. Um, Mr. Paula did mention I'm kind of a music freak, so that does, <laughs> does make its way into the conservancy over here, here and again. So that's all I had, but there's a, uh, a smiling landing turtle. They always have a smile. <laughs> uh, who wants to know if, if you have any questions? I would love that, or we can have some discussion. Yes. How does the Black Swamp Conservancy relate with Nature Conservancy? We are totally separate organizations. Uh, Nature Conservancy is a large international organization. They do some really wonderful work here locally. We partner together on a lot of things. They. Um, they don't hold a lot of land in Northwest Fly. So they've got their uh, Grady Marsh out on the lake, and then they've got Kitty Todd and the new uh, Sand Hill Crane Weapons, all amazing places. Uh, they've got a really good staff of talented people who help um, other organizations with restoration. Um, so we, the thing, one of the things that's great about Northwest Ohio is we all play really nicely together in the conservation <laughs> community. So they're really good friends, but we're separate things. Oh. Um, do the affluence and the manure discharges from the concentrated animal feeding operation make your work more difficult? Do they neutralize your work at all? Or is there a problem in that regard? Um, I, I think it's pretty clear that the, the manure and the capos are one of the truly significant contributors to 
nutrient pollution in the Maumee River and Lake Erie. Uh, not the only one, um, all agriculture and home septic and all of that, but but there's definitely scientific evidence to show that the chemicals are, are over contributing their share. Um, so in that regard, they make it more difficult, but our strategy is the same. Our strategy is to put a wetland in a place that will intercept that runoff between the edge of the field and entering a major river system that's going to feed a leak here. If we can do that, we can really address the agricultural runoff, the septic runoff, um, you know, whether it's it's chemical nutrients that are going on the field and cutting off, or it's mineral nutrients. Um, you know, the, the real goal is just to hold it on the landscape and use it up before it gets into a major water system. Yes. Hey Rob, this was really great um, for a lot of reasons, but because it's so hopeful, um, seeing so many positive things happening. Are equally positive things happening in other parts of the state or are you kind of leading the way here? Well, our, our issues are different. Um, you know, because of the tiling, because of the, the loss of weapons that we've suffered here in Northwest Ohio, we are in a unique position. We we have the biggest challenges, we have unique challenges, and we need to address them in unique ways, which is what we're, we're aspiring to do with what our work is aimed at doing. Um, there are other problems in Northwest Ohio, or excuse me, elsewhere in Ohio, and there are other fantastic groups uh, working on them. H2 Ohio has now expanded and is helping with a lot of that. You know, you get into Southeast Ohio, and they don't have the nutrient issues we have, but they have acid mines that they have to deal with. Um, so it, it's really important to have, you know, locally focused efforts on the ground and led by by locals who are invested and care and knowledgeable. Um, so I, I think our, our colleagues throughout the state are working with different issues, um, but there's good work going on there. Yeah. Yeah, um, my question, you've been at this quite a while now, so um, are you starting to see what kind of maintenance is required for restorations of this size, you know, over over the long term? And um, do you think we're going to see the support for that um, from H2 Ohio going forward? I mean, that, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, there's a couple different ways to approach how we design and engineer these projects. Mm -hmm. And our organization always goes for passive natural systems. Um, you know, there are a lot of people that will advocate for pumping water out of a river um, and into a wetland. Um, pumps are the, the big thing that scare me. We don't do any pumps. That pump's gonna fail at some point sure. and it's gonna be 30 or $40,000 mm -hmm. to repair or replace. And, and I don't know where we'll come up with that in 15 years. Um, so everything we do is kind of built to self-sustain itself. That being said, when we take a bare farm field and we, you know, move all that soil and put in the, the vegetation that we want, the first thing that's going to happen is we have a lot of invasive species that start invading. Um, so we spent, we have a full field crew of college kids with a full um a uh, full full time field steward um, who just works to battle that stuff, and it's expensive. And H two Ohio does not cover it. Um, that is covered by our supporters who support our work and donate to us to to help us manage and maintain this land. And and it's going to be long term and sustaining work. We're really going to continue to need that help for a long time. Yes. I don't know if my question will make sense, but you didn't seem to focus or even talk much between about the corporate farming versus the natural or farm, natural farms. And it seems to me from my history that there's a struggle there. Is there such a thing and how do you want it? Do you want rather not address it or is that at the political and governmental level? Does that make sense? Well, I, I think you can draw 
a real distinction between combined animal operations and everything else. So Tom asked about the, the manure issue and how we're dealing with that. Um, you know, the larger corporate grain farms or a small grain farm, in most cases, the techniques are pretty similar. Um, the issues that we're seeing are similar. The reality is to farm land in Northwest Ohio, it has to be tiled. And th those tiles are gonna take sediments and nutrients off the farm, no matter who's farming their own scale. Um, I have my soapbox issues. I, I think for the most part, the agricultural community is really trying to do their best. They don't wanna lose their nutrients. They don't wanna lose their topsoil. Um, I, my opinion is that one of the biggest parts of the problem is that most of the advice they get is from the farm bill. And the farm bill is a big national package that is not designed for Northwest Ohio and this radically engineered landscape <clears throat> that we have. So, you know, we can tell farmers all day long you need a filter strip at the end of your farm, and it's a good practice and we can fund it. But when you're shooting 70% of your water <laughs> out through a drainage pipe underneath that filter strip, how much are we doing? So, I, 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 you know, there, there's definitely people who are doing organic operations and very small scale um, vegetable production. But, you know, in, in large part, um, agriculture looks pretty similar to like West Ohio. Just to follow up, mm -hmm. so at a governmental level, whether it's at the congressional level or the state level, there's big money involved in that too, is there not? There's a in corporate power. Indeed. How do you deal with that? I don't. You know, <laughs> we, we do not. We're a non-political organization. Um, our role is natural habitat and putting wetlands out there and uh, addressing water quality to the extent that we can with those, expanding wildlife populations. There are other organizations working on policy, and I personally, I study environmental policy. And I'm so glad I don't do that. <laughs> I'm so frustrated. <laughs> yeah, Jenny. If you buy a property and restore it, how do you protect it in the future from not being sold in the bill? Yeah, in one of two ways. Um, oftentimes, we own that property in perpetuity. And, and we, uh, if we work through the Clean Ohio program or um, the H2 Ohio program or any of the federal programs, Part of the condition of getting a grant for that is that we record deed restrictions that prevent any adverse use, any clearing of the investment that they're making. Um, in those projects where we work, and we do a lot of this as well, where we work with another entity, uh, which might be a park district, it might be a local government, and we it might be a school district, and we, we create these preserves and hand them off, we uh, hold conservation easements on those properties. And that is a permanent legal agreement that's um, recorded with the county, uh, it runs with the land forever, and we monitor those properties at least once a year. If we put boots on the ground, we make sure that the restrictions that we put on them are being complied with, and if at any time in the future um, those restrictions are broken, we are legally responsible for defending the property, which could be anything from a conversation to a prolonged court battle. Charlie. Uh, I've been reading uh, more and more about um, regenerative farming and, and permaculture. I don't know how well it's taking hold in, in this part of the country at all, but uh, do you have any conservation projects that are adjacent to farmers who are working on that, uh, that kind of solution? I've been reading about that a lot, too. Mm -hmm. um, and I, there are a handful of folks in Northwest Ohio that are doing really cool things in regenerative agriculture and permaculture. For the most part, it's pretty small scale and it, it just hasn't been adapted on a landscape level yet. Uh, one of the things that we're working on, and this is a long game for us, it is actually a program where we will own land, farm land for agricultural purposes and lease it out to people who want to do that at 
cut rate prices. Mm -hmm. My challenge with that program is that there are no grants out there that are going to pay for us to buy agricultural land and keep it agricultural. Mm -hmm. Um, so if anyone wants to donate their farm to us, <laughs> we will put it to good use. And um, we have a whole program that's devised. We have a couple of small properties that we've teamed up with farmers who are doing those things. Um, but really, we need gifts to land to, to move that forward. Yes? Well, Rob, so beside gifts of land, how, how do you identify? I mean, there seems to be so much property that is worthy of saving. How does the Conservancy identify properties that are going to require an investment in their end. I love that question. <laughs> uh, we've done a lot of planning. Um, so we have a strategic natural area plan uh, that was developed, um, which identifies the best remnant habitats in Northwest Ohio that have not been protected. And we pulled together 100 people probably over like a five year period to create that list. Uh, we go through, we update it every year. So we we know where those remnants are. Every now and again, we get a phone call and we're like, whoa, mm -hmm. we missed that one. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the most part, we know where the remnants are. Mm -hmm. For the restoration projects, um, we've done something I'm really excited about. Um, we got some pilot project funding through the Land Trust Alliance, which is a national organization that we belong to, that's conservancies like ours all throughout the country, all working in their own neighborhood. And what we did with that is we built a GIS, uh, Geographical Information System model uh, that we call PERM. Uh, it's the Parcel-Based Ecological Restoration mm -hmm. Layer. And it identifies every single parcel of land in Northwest Ohio, and it ranks it on its um, soil suitability, on its restoration potential, on its connectivity to other natural habitats. It's, there's like 27 parameters that go into this thing. And it generates, it kicks out a score for us of one to 100. So for every piece of land in Northwest Ohio, we can run it through this model and get that score. And H2 Ohio has been super excited about that. They actually funded a grant for us to go out and hey, any property 90 or above, you guys have the resources to go out and execute on those projects. Um, they then took it a step further and said, we need this for the whole state of Ohio. Would it be okay if we used your model and turned it into something bigger and better? And we said, heck yeah. So right now they're uh, they're finishing up phase two. I think actually we're on phase three now. We pulled the University of Toledo in. Um, this GIS model just keeps growing and growing, but it's, it's doing a fantastic job of identifying the best properties where we can get the most bang for our buck, turning them from marginal agricultural land into natural habitats. Yes. Well, where did you get your start in all of this? Like how how far back can you go where the earth was speaking to you? <laughs> I was going to say dumb luck. Um, <laughs> I mean, if I go all the way back, I, I grew up on the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland um, before I came out to Bowling Green and studied environmental policy. And I was a kid who ran around, you know, the, the wetlands of the Chesapeake Bay and caught frogs and turtles. And when I was 10 years old, I had a canoe and I'd go out and do crab pots in, in the Chesapeake. Um, and I think that's why the education programs and getting the kids is so important because you really have to develop those formative experiences when you're young um, to spark the passion that, that really carry through with life. Do you do a lot with school children? Like, do they come out and look, like observe or um, dig in or whatever? More and more, uh, we, we do get volunteer groups. We do, I should have mentioned, we do regular volunteer um, days. So if anyone wants to come out and help with preserve management, um, and we can tailor that to any group of any age. Um, but but really this new learning landscape is is our, our big lift effort to do something a little more meaningful with education than, than go into the classroom and give a lecture or have kids out for one day once and then they forget it. We really want to integrate into long-term investments. Do you do anything with um, 
trying to reach out to Central City kids? Not yet. That that is definitely one hundred percent the plan. Um, but there are unique challenges in the center city, and we really feel like we need to build out the base of this program um, and know what we're doing before we we go into those challenges. There's so many kids that don't see anything. You know, they're never outside, and um, you know, you talk about. A salamander, they have no idea what that is. You know, it's, it's sad, but gotta keep reaching out somehow. Salamander in every small animal, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. No. Thank you, Rob. Thank you for a very enlightening, very educational evening. Um, and before we started, I said, well, uh, I, I really give us some hope. Well, indeed, you have. Um, the programs that you've developed, uh, the passion with which you approach, and the passion that you share with others is really very remarkable, and we thank you. Um, our land is blessed because of you and all the work that you do, so very much we thank you. And we thank you for coming and spending the evening with us.